Good evening and welcome to live coverage of the Grand Canyon Star Party, live from the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, my name is Kevin Schindler. I'm the Historian and Public Information Officer at Lowell Observatory, and I'm joined by fellow Buckeye, Dean Regas, the astronomer at the Cincinnati Observatory. Great to be here. Today. Oh, I'm excited to be here. I'm all lit up and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, you have a nice Well, I, I, uh, the, the battery's going to wear out in a second. I better turn <laughs> off. Anyway, uh, glad to be here. I'm uh, from Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati Observatory, and here at the Grand Canyon Star Party. This is my sixth time being sixth here. Year, yeah. Uh, it is just amazing. I love coming here for this. And every year, um, it, it, it's just so much fun. Right now, we're sitting, we have a little bit of a red light on us, but we can see looking out. We can see bright Venus and some stars up, but then we see little red lights here and there. But there's a lot of, of excitement. There's a lot of murmuring going on, people talking about um, different things they're looking at through 50 different telescopes here. Um, there's hundreds of people here right now. Um, and so it's really a fun experience to be able to be here and share um, what we're doing here with images live from the observatory. Oh, it's so cool. I mean, it's really, really dark. It's nice and clear tonight. The Milky Way is starting to pop out. Yes. And I think just like it's the energy. Like this is what I love about it. It's just the hundreds of people that are like milling around. You can hear them, their enthusiasm for the subject. And uh, um, so excited to be joining, uh, you know, link to to Lowell. And what? so what do we got here? What's, uh, what, oh, what's the setup? You know, we're, so tonight, um, for anybody watching, if you want to take a look at something, um, just just uh, send a message and we'll try to um, get that in. We have Del Dylan Short using one of the telescopes at the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory, a low observatory. So through the magic of technology, we're sitting at the south rim. Dylan is sitting there. And then behind the scenes, we have Alex and Heather uh, pushing all the buttons. And Cody um, is nearby here um, managing this whole effort. Um, and so we're able to look at different things. So if you want to look at something, Dylan, we'll see if we can get it. And we started with M101, um, the, the pinwheel um, galaxy, which has been in the news a lot lately. Why oh, yeah, that? definitely. So yeah. what's been happening is that the uh, amateur astronomers first spotted this light that happened on one of the arms. And if you look at this picture here of the pinwheel galaxy, you see the, the core of the galaxy has this bright light. But then there's this little extra dot on one of those arms. And that's a supernova that just flared up in brightness just a few weeks ago. Like it wasn't there. And then all of a sudden, bang, super bright. Uh, so it's got everybody really excited because... It, this wasn't something that they like, you know, big time uh, telescopes saw. This was like people with yep. their own scopes could image and see. And uh, you can see it in this picture here. That that dot, I think you were circling it earlier, is the actual supernova right there. And th and this is so exciting because um, people here are able to see it. Um, you know, so this is something that astronomers were studying, professional astronomers who do research. But anybody with a telescope, you can look at this and see it. And we're looking at it live right now. Yeah, we uh, last night uh, one of the, the the amateur astronomers pointed their scope at it, and you could you can you don't see it quite in this detail because yeah. this is a long exposure photograph that's doing this, but you can see the core of the galaxy and you can see the supernova, and in the scope they almost look similar in brightness. So this is what yeah. supernova when a, a supermassive star explodes like this. It releases so much energy and so much light that it's as bright as the galaxy itself. So one star for a moment becomes as bright as a whole galaxy of stars. Uh, and uh, we haven't seen one in a galaxy this close to us in a while. So and then, and it's interesting to look at this because this is kind of like our home galaxy. This is a spiral galaxy, um, and I mean you can imagine something like this happening in our galaxy. I know. I'm waiting because you know, we got some stars out there that we're looking for and. Uh, uh, you know, Antares is out in the sky uh -huh. right now, which is a supernova candidate. Uh, Betelgeuse, of course, that yep. uh, people are always watching. Uh, but uh, yeah, this seeing this is really, really cool. And uh, uh, and so we're 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 taking requests. Is yes. that what's happening here? Yeah, so you can type in if, and if you want to see anything, um, let us know. Type in a message. Also, if you have any questions, um, we'd be here. Dean has written several books about astronomy, including your latest. 
Let's yes, I don't know that. if you can see it. All right. Yeah, I just happen to have it right here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't see it that well, but it's called 1,000 Facts About Space uh, from National Geographic. So we talk about all different types of uh uh, things in, in around like planets, around stars, galaxies, space travel. And uh, so it's a lot of fun. So if anybody has any just general space questions, feel free to type that in yes. the chat. We can read those and uh, take any requests if people want to see something like uh, what's on our list. Like, uh, oh, you know, like the Sombrero Galaxy uh, is one of my favorites because because it's so cool and it looks like a Sombrero hat. So which is perfect for Arizona. And there's also some neat connection to um, early astronomical uh, research um, uh -huh. with the recessional velocity, the first evidence of the expanding universe that plays a big role. So when we look at that, we'll talk about it a little bit more. And uh, we do have a, a question here. Somebody was asking, um, what's the exposure time? Um, it's about 27 seconds. And so that's why we're able to see that a little bit more than if you took just a, like you were saying, a quick glance out of the telescope. Um, it's, it's a longer exposure that allows you to gather some of that fainter light. But um, this M101, this pinwheel galaxy, is about 20, 21 million light years away. And so, you know, sitting at the canyon, you think about the antiquity of things. Um, 20 million, 21 million light years ago, the light we're seeing on the screen here started traveling to us well before um, the Colorado River started forming Grand Canyon. Oh, wow. That happened like 6 million years ago. So, so we wouldn't even be here. It would just be this boring, flat, you know, area it's neat to compare the age of things that happened in the grand canyon compared to you know some of the stuff we're looking oh at yeah what the universe looked like then yeah i mean this is this is so far away it's hard to picture light years you know one light year is about six trillion miles yeah whatever that is right and this is 21 million of those uh, to this galaxy so man uh oh are we Dylan, switching that looks like some bro galaxy to me that's what I would guess. Sombrero is a sombrero is a classic. Um, it's in it's in the constellation Virgo, about twenty eight million light years away or so, and and this is a a complete galaxy. So we're looking at, I don't know, something like eight hundred billion stars in that. But it's so cool because here we are in Arizona, and what better thing to look at than this thing that kind of looks like a sombrero hat? But I was mentioning also about some of this early history because. In 1912, a scientist here in Arizona, um, Vesto Slifer, um, was he was doing just revolutionary revolutionary work, taking long term exposures of these fuzzy blobs in space that were then called spiral nebulae. Today we know they was looking at well, we know today's galaxies, but Percival Lowell had him looking for these things because Lowell thought that these might be protoplanetary systems. Uh -huh. um, so he wanted to have him look at their spectra to see if their elements matched what you see in Jupiter and Saturn and so on, and they didn't. But what Schleifer found was in general, they're moving at incredible speeds away from us, some, some something like 900 times the speed of sound. And Schleifer and others didn't know what to make of it, except that this thing is moving 900 times the speed of sound away from us. Um, and even if, even if the earth is a thousand years old, you know, the, the universe is much vaster uh, much older than we could ever have imagined. Um, so this Sombrero galaxy is one of the early things that that Slifer used to come up with this his idea that um, that the first observational evidence that the universe is expanding. And then Hubble came along a couple of decades later, mm -hmm. used its, it, this information as his own, um, as well as being able to measure the distances to things by a, a female astronomer, and um, and that. Thus came the expanding universe theory and the Big Bang, and you have a book about that, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, there's something in there yeah, too. Right. What year was that? About the 1912. Early 1912. Yeah, when he started making the first observations. Oh, that's cool. And he did that at Lowell. And, yeah, uh, he used the 24 inch refractor, which is the same telescope. If you drive around downtown Flagstaff, you see what looks like a big birthday cake on the side of the hill. I mean, like a 40 foot tall birthday cake, and that holds the the old Clark telescope that he used for those observations. And so at about the same time that Arizona was earning statehood, um, he was determining that the universe is expanding. 
Same year. Yeah. So and I, I visited uh, earlier in the week. I was up at Lowell and I got to look through the 24 inch scope yeah. and we were looking at this uh, globular cluster called M5. Oh, yeah. Uh, which M5 is a great one. Yeah. yeah and, and that was such a cool thing to put your eye up to the eyepiece and see this for yourself. And, uh, and, and you know, we might it's kind of popping around in the sky a little bit, um, but we could look at a globular. We have M13. It's a little bit away from um, Sabro, but um but but this is easy to move this stuff around i think i i say that to dylan as if it's easy but but he's such he's so proficient with this are we but, gonna test him out are we gonna see uh yeah i mean and m13 is like like m5 and m3 we, we're using these names these m this and m that yeah and what does m stand for m not... m stands for messier uh -huh. a guy named charles messier who was the uh uh this <laughs> he was basically a comet hunter he was trying to find comets and he saw these fuzzy things in the telescope like this like we see this one yeah uh and he he didn't want to mistake them for comets he wanted uh, uh so he made this list of non-comets yeah basically. avoid these annoying things yeah yeah and now be, those become like the 110, 109 things that everybody wants to try to right. find with their telescopes. And and um, and we're it looks like we're getting on M thirteen. Um, that was fast. Like a globular cluster in Hercules, also called the Hercules cluster. And this is a this is a really a favorite thing for stargazers, I think, because uh, you know you're looking at something that has oh a half million stars or so, and there there are other ones. So Messier made this catalog. M one is the first thing he looked at. This is the 13th one he recorded, M13. M3 and M5 are a couple other globulars um, that are really pretty cool to see. And, yeah. and so there's, I, oh, we should ans answer this question, I guess. Caleb wanted to know if the Orion Nebula is visible. You got to wait a little bit. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it's the wrong season for the Orion Nebula. It's one of my favorite things to see, but it's uh, kind of close to where the sun is. Yeah. So it's already down below the ground and... Uh, yeah, I have to wait a few months till it comes out in the morning sky. Yeah, and one of the things that's kind of easy to remember with that is it's kind of opposite Scorpius in the sky. And Scorpius, um, you can see really easily over here. There it is, right <laughs> over our shoulder. Is rising to the east, and soon Sagittarius comes up next to it. And Scorpius actually looks like um, what it's supposed to. I think of. it does look like it a looks scorpion. like a scorpion. Um, and, you know, we're talking about these constellations, but we're talking about the Greek Roman constellations. And we're both from Ohio. Yep, yep. And Ohio has 88 counties we were just talking about. Yep. And there's also 88 um, classic Greek Roman constellations. There's also, by the way, 88 keys on a piano. So there's some magical thing there. Isn't that great trivia? Yes. Um, amazing. But, but, to your but um, it's, it's interesting sitting here in Grand Canyon because there's 11 indigenous tribes that have a connection here. And like other civilizations around the world, They've had their own set of constellations. Um, we remember the Greek Roman ones because that's also what's used for astronomers. Um, astronomers think of constellations as specific geographic areas of the sky, like like countries. They have specific borders. Um, and so we talk about these constellations and we talk about a group of stars like the Big Dipper. But to the Diné, the Navajo, um, they see it as the revolving male um, in Cassiopeia. Um, is the revolving female they're revolving around the home fire which is the north star and so um it's it's great to remember all these different mythological stories um, that are out there oh definitely yeah and so this one is uh you know this cluster is in the constellation of hercules mm -hmm. um so it's sometimes called the hercules cluster as well uh and hercules is a tough constellation to identify or at least yeah. to imagine because it's not bright like orion it looks kind of like a spider or, uh, but the, uh, so it's not an easy one to find. That's for sure. Yeah. And it, but it's, um, you know, when you know where to look is there's a square and yeah, yeah. You have to use your imagination to see like a person, like this star is a leg and that star is a leg. And yeah. that's, you know, you have to have a certain amount of alcohol intake or sleep deprivation. Or well, I um, always to make say, these things yeah, out. I always say you can't compete with the ancient imagination. That, right. They were really, really, <laughs> bored and we can't get nothing else that. to do yeah, oh, yeah. You go like, outside and look at the stars and like hey doesn't that look like bob down the street yeah that's that's bob yeah yeah, yeah. and <laughs> and the ancients you know they they couldn't see m13 although you know with binoculars you can make it out certainly um but it's it's twenty two thousand or so light years away give or take a few feet and you know that's 
in astronomical terms um, compared to things in our solar system, like Venus, which is setting behind us, that's far away. But compared to other things like galax galaxies, you know, it's right next door to us. And in fact, it's, you know, and we get, we've talked about this earlier, you know, we're looking outside, it's getting nice and dark out here. And on a good dark night, you can see a couple thousand stars or so. Almost everything you're seeing is in our galaxy. There's one or some people can see another galaxy, but the Andromeda galaxy, um, you can make out if you, you know, at the right time of year and everything. But it's amazing to think everything we're seeing pretty much is in our galaxy. It looks like we have another question oh, yeah. uh, from Bill Smith. How are the colors of Alberio show up in this scope? Ooh, well, see how Alberio is one of these cool double stars and they have contrasting colors. Now, everybody, when you look at with your eye, everybody and, has a little different. Dylan, I think Dylan's going to get Alberio. Is that is that what you're doing, Dylan? I look um, like Alberio. Oh, yeah. It's just yeah, getting the right color balance there. But go ahead. You're talking about the colors. Yeah. So it's it's we think I mean, like uh, every telescope's a little different. Everybody's eyes are different. But uh, traditionally, you think that the bigger of the stars is orange in color and the smaller of the stars is blue in color. So they have these great contrasting things. But other people see it as more like white. The blue is more white and the, the orange is more yellow. Uh, but I think we're getting a little bit of color coming through on the screen yeah. here. The, so yeah, you can definitely see, you know, I see the, the bluish green on the lower left. Um, faint. Yeah, so these are two stars. Uh, this is in the, a double star in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan, which is up at this time. It's also called the Northern Cross because it looks like a cross shape. And this is the head of the swan or the bottom of the long part of the cross. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. And, and it's it's really great, you know, at this time of year when you start seeing Cygnus coming up and, and, and it's part of the um, Northern um, the Triangle. The summer triangle. Yep, <laughs> I'm yep. trying to get the right word. Summer triangle. Yeah, yeah. So we have Altair and Achilla the Eagle, um, Vega and Lyra the Harp, mm -hmm. and Deneb and Cygnus the Swan. Yeah. And when you see that summer triangle, it's cool because, you know, summer's coming. That's right. But also the Milky Way is coming up behind it. Yeah. And that's in a in a couple of hours here when we can really see it, it's gonna be pretty cool. And and we were talking earlier, um Raider Lane, who's the dark sky ranger here. And largely responsible for um, Grand Canyon getting Dark Sky Park um, designation. And he's been leading this star party for years. He was pointing out that only 20% um, of people in the world live in a place where you can see the, the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's kind of sad. It is. I mean, I can't see where I am in Cincinnati. Yeah. It's just, you can't. Oh, you're going to move to Flagstaff. Well, so you know, I, 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 these guys are winning <laughs> me over. That's for sure. I mean, it, it like, so if you're at Lowell at night and yeah. it's, you know, no moon in the sky, yeah. you, can you see the Milky Way just faintly, even in the city of Flagstaff? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's great. You know, it's great in the fall. You know, I'm kind of a baseball fan. In the fall, you can see the gray square Pegasus. Huh? And it looks like, you know, the base is a baseball diamond. And off third base, there's a couple stars and a couple more. And, and, and it's really, <laughs> when you know where to look, it's really easy to find. Oh, that's cool. And, and you know, you use a ver division some where you don't look directly at it, but kind of look to the side the way our eyes work. But but you can make it out pretty well, even from downtown Flagstaff. Or, or this, you know, we talk about seeing the Milky Way. Of course, we're in the Milky Way. We're talking about seeing the center of it. The densest concentration of stars but i you know through the years my years of low being you know there's seventy thousand people three quarters of a mile away from us yeah right down the hill but flagstaff has these dark skies and i've seen so many people saying oh i thought it was going to be clear tonight what are those clouds yeah. and that's oh the milky way yeah, and yeah. then i've seen people cry because seeing the milky way you really feel connected to the universe around you oh yeah well, it looks and, like somebody's typed in. Yes, you can see yep. the Milky Way now. Excellent. Oh, good. Yeah, from where we're from where we're sitting right now, we've got this little red light, so it's hard to see faint stuff. Yeah, we uh, lost but, our night vision, but that's all right. But <laughs> yeah, with you know seeing the summer triangle coming up, and and then you know right next to that, we talk about Scorpius mm -hmm. looking actually like the scorpion, but then next to it, the next thing to come up is Sagittarius, um, which. You know, there's the mythology behind it, but it looks like a tea kettle. Yeah. <laughs> and and there it looks like steam coming out of the tea kettle. That's the Milky Way. 
And so it's really kind of a cool thing to look at as we get darker here. Um, we'll be able to see that pretty well. Well, I see our uh, shopping list here. Can I request uh, yeah. one? Because I we've looked at a galaxy. We've looked yep. at a globular cluster. We look at a double star. How about a nebula? Like I was thinking M8. Oh, M8. The Lagoon Nebula. How would M8 look for, for you guys? Can we try to switch over that? And that's uh, in Sagittarius. It might be a little low. I don't know. Yeah. So if uh, we'll we'll get that, a we'll it get might a be yes. a little bit later, but we can check and we'll see. We'll get a yeah. yes or no. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think the other one that would be well, that would be a nebula that's forming stars. So I kind of that's why I was kind of thinking. Yeah. Like, but if we can't get eight, what? then <laughs> so fifty seven maybe would be interesting. Yeah, M fifty seven is should be high enough, and M fifty seven the ring nebula is spectacular, tiny but spectacular. And, you know, we're we're talking here about astronomy. We're talking about we're both from Ohio. But also something else that um, is fun to share is that we've both had the honor to serve as astronomer in residence here. Yeah. The Grand Canyon. Um, the Grand Canyon Conservancy started this program several years ago. So Grand Canyon Conservancy is kind of the funding arm, the nonprofit partner of Grand Canyon National Park. And so they support so much programming is done here. And so... You were you served at you were two years ago or a year ago? So yeah, a year and a half ago, yeah. November twenty twenty one. I I served at so I was out here at the Grand Canyon for a month and did education programs and uh, uh, star parties and viewing and even down at the bottom of the canyon and at Phantom Ranch yeah. doing things. It Just was, use the telescope down there. Yeah, yeah. It was, I I I was glad I didn't have to carry it down myself. So that was yeah. good. Uh, it was just incredible being down there and just seeing the night sky and just living, living here. And uh, I said, it's, you know, visiting the Grand Canyon is inspiring. Living here is life altering. It, it really you is. You look at things yeah. differently. Yeah. I, I, when I came back, I, there was uh, I, man, I missed it so bad. And uh, so that's why I try to get here as much as possible. And then uh, talking to you and other folks that have done this, like, uh, cause you just got done, like finished yeah, up like your a, residency. Yeah. June 1st was my last day. And then oh I've gosh. been back twice. So I haven't had the girls <laughs> quite that you have yet. Yeah. And yeah. I have the, you know, I'm fortunate to live an hour and a half away. Yeah. Oh my gosh. But, but it's, it's, you know, Grand Canyon Conservancy is, it goes back decades and it was founded by Edwin, Eddie McKee, okay. who was, um, an early naturalist geologist here for a long time. And, um, you look at, you know, Grand Canyon is so special because of it's, it's such a unique place. But I think the thing that sticks with people is the fact that we have rangers and educators, interpreters explaining what you're seeing. Um, it That's what sticks with people. Yeah. Like we find that at Little Observatory also. People comment on, it was great to look at telescopes, but it's so-and-so Dylan who found these objects for us. It was life-changing for my kids. And so the conservancy and creating programs like this, you know, you talk to hundreds, thousands of people inspire them about the night sky. Yeah, yeah. And so I think applications are open yes. for the current year. So if you know anybody that uh, would be interested in being an astronomer in residence, now is a good time. I think they're booking for 2024. Yep. And, uh, and they're not just, it's not just like research astronomers. Right, right. Um, I, I'm a historian. Yep. Um, there, There's artists. Yep, you'd be artists and um, residents. Musicians also. apply. I mean, so there's a lot of different folks. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you should do it. And uh, I don't know if you've heard, uh, there's rumblings that there's going to be an alumni yes. program. So we're 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 coming back. Yes. Well, well you know, hopefully. it's great to come back for these sort of things. And you know, I know when I was setting up the same telescope you used, yeah, hiked down a Phantom and and what we now call Havasupai Gardens, and you know we had some clouds early in the evening, but then, um, but then several nights I was getting openings in the lower east part of the sky and there's vega yeah and if you see vega the ring nebula which we see right now is pretty it's it's in that constellation and you know through a smaller telescope the ring nebula looks like a tiny cheerio mm -hmm. yep. or a donut yep. but here you see some color and you know with a big telescope i can't oh yeah there you can goes. see a central Zoom star yeah. there yeah. so so um m57 is you can see why it's called the ring nebula um, but it's a planetary nebula. Um, let's talk about what that is a little bit. 
Yeah, that is so this is basically a sun like star at the end of its life. So you take yeah, this is uh, us in five billion years. Yeah, pretty much. And so that ring that we're seeing is the star basically can't hold itself together. So uh, there's this internal pressure pushing out gravity, holding it together. And when you get to this stage of the star, the gravity loses. And so it just goes out in this ring of material. And at the very center of that, if you look real carefully, see a dot. That's the star that did this. And it continues on in a new stage of life called a white dwarf star. So if you if you think, all right, well, our sun's going to explode like this, the star will continue. Uh, bad news. Yes. All the planets will probably be wiped out. But still, the star will continue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, think about um, the distance of this twenty five hundred or so light years away. So the light we're seeing started traveling to us twenty five hundred years ago. Oh, man. I mean, it's just sometimes hard to imagine. We can imagine what a foot is, or or an inch or a mile, but a light year, six trillion miles. It's it's hard to imagine these vast distances in space. But when you put them in context with, it's taken two thousand years for that light to get to us. That really tells you where we're looking back in time. And and it's just like during the daytime, you look at the layers of rock here and the lower you get, the older they get. And it's a, it's a time capsule at the canyon. The sky's the same thing. It's a time capsule. Yeah. And this so this is a, a object in the constellation Lyra the Harp. So it's close up to the, the star Vega up in the uh, eastern sky. And, and you can find this with a moderate size telescope, but yeah, this with the color, the, what's the exposure on this one? This is still the 22nd range or something. I'm not like sure. Dylan might type that in here in a second. But yeah, you can you normally, like you said, it yeah, looks like a gray Cheerio or 17 gray, seconds, uh, yeah. 17 seconds. But yeah. yeah. You get the color out of there and everything. Yeah. You're really, you're really picking up a lot here. And you know, something else that I, that I like about Lyra is that um, when John Wesley Powell, was going down the Colorado River. Um, he would look at the stars at night, and one night saw Vega um, in Lyra, and and when he realized what it was, where they were, it was it was a point or something, but they called it the Harp Point, okay, the Point of Harp or oh, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, after after seeing Vega in this constellation. Oh, that's cool. And they certainly used, you know, did a lot of observing, you know, to observe the height of the sun to determine their latitude and things like that and they had a lot of instruments they took with them so oh we've got vega here moved it right on over to vega we're gonna talk about it and it happens and and you know it's great you know you think okay what's that star look like through telescope it looks like a bigger dot yeah um, yeah <laughs> doesn't look like much more no no deneb or i mean deneb um alberio the double star it's neat because you can distinguish it as two stars um and that's something interesting, like, you know, right now, the Big Dipper is as we're sitting up into our left and there's three stars of the handle and the middle star. It looks like a single star. But if you look closely, there's with your naked eye, if you have decent eyesight, you can see a couple Mizar and Elcor. Um, but if you look at it through the telescope, you can see a bunch. And so, you know, it's amazing to think over half the stars up there are multiple star systems. Um, if you have telescopes strong enough, you can make out. You know, two or more. Stars. Oh, and there we are now. I think that's handle stars, maybe. Uh, it looks like, um, shoot, I can't remember what the other one's called. But yeah, I don't remember the names, and but yeah, yeah. And so in the old days, this was a good um, test of eyesight. If you can make a bite, my darn elk or, you know, good enough to go off to. Double star looks like a snowman, almost like a big star yeah. on the bottom, little star on the top. That's uh, Mizar is the big star. Uh, Alcor is the other one. And yeah, this has been one that our understanding of has changed since yes. I've been an astronomer. Like when I started, we just astronomers assumed the two stars were not associated. Yeah. They were one yeah. was farther away than the other, and it just looked like they were lined up. And now new evidence to say, no, they are going around each other. Is that what you've heard too? Yeah, was, yep. And that's changed since not that long ago. So I was just going to say that either says that you've been around for a long time yeah. or that <laughs> we're, yeah. and, and this is really astronomy. You know, you think like when the Hubble came up, came around a couple of decades ago and, and they pointed it 
um, in a blank area in space, essentially, and did the 10 day exposure and saw all these new galaxies. Yeah. And so astronomy, you can look at the same place, but we have ever improving technology. You can discover new things and new technology to analyze that. And so it, it's it's we don't look up and say, OK, we know, we know all there is to know. It's one of those things. The more you know, the less, you know, Yep. you realize how much there still is to learn. It's like back in the mid 1900s, um, a lot of astronomers started stopped studying planets because they figured we, we we know all there is to know. Yeah. And now planets aren't the purview of astronomers as much as geologists because we see them as worlds, not as just something in the sky. Yeah. Oh, I oh, I I see. We might be going to the Whirlpool Galaxy, one of the classic yes, in the sky. Please, M51. please, that would be great. 30 million light years away or so. Like, yeah, again, we think, what was the Earth like 30 million years ago? That was well before our species was even a glint in a creator's eye, as it were. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, just a, a much different time. So, yeah, this is another galaxy up, uh, I think it's an Ursa Major. It's up pretty up. It's close to that, high. Canis Venatici, oh, somewhere right. in that region. Yep. And yeah. and it's it's got not only that galaxy, but it's got the uh, a nearby galaxy that's interacting with it. And it's just part of, you know, it's part of, it's so classic when you see this. Yep. So, yeah, we need a longer exposure for this one. So we might have yeah. to wait a little bit. And that's the thing. I mean, we're, we're looking at, when we look at Venus, which is, which is set, so we're not going to look at that. But it's bright. You don't need much of exposure. But the fainter it is, exposure. And that's why we're talking about VM Slifer. Oh, there we go. Look at what? that. Come on. You did that? That's it's ridiculous that's just so cool <laughs> it just keeps getting better this is almost cheating this is uh and you yeah, can, this is really and good. you can see it's the so other good. galaxy next to it that one doesn't have as 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 cool of a name ngc 5795 oh i never knew so it's other that's yeah. another catalog the the new next uh, the new generation general catalog new or, general catalog new yeah, general yep. catalog yeah um and so I, I'm confusing it with we had a next generation Lowell telescope. Oh yeah, yeah. That became the Discovery cool. Child telescope that's now called the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Yeah. Our 4.3 meter uh, mammoth telescope at Lowell Observatory for research. But so, the, the whirlpool is so distinct, and then with that companion galaxy, um, when you see it, you you know what you're looking at. Yeah. So we got two galaxies, you know, interacting with each other. A uh, big spiral one and a smaller one over there. And so we see galaxies like this in you know, Hubble telescope pictures and James Webb telescope pictures that they pass each other and stars can be stolen from one galaxy to the other. Yep. And spiral arms can be kind of uh, elongated and disturbed. And uh, so this is, uh, we get a ton of questions about, say, so, well, is anything going to run into the Milky Way someday? Yeah. And uh, there's only one that's really heading our way, and that's the Andromeda Galaxy. Yeah. So the two of us are going to be colliding uh, any day now. Yeah, cash in your life and chance. <laughs> Go, go buy stuff at the Lowell gift shop. Yeah, right? uh, I think four to six billion years yeah. time frame. So uh, I, I joke with people like one of my talk last night, we were talking about that. The, the two are going to collide. And then somebody said, well, isn't the sun going to blow up about that time, too? And I'm like, yeah, that's going to be a tough a yeah, billion years. That's gonna be, yeah. yeah, and four to five billion years from now, our ancestors are going to have some big problems yeah, to we're, solve. we're in trouble but yeah. you know uh, we're okay for now <laughs> so how did you get into astronomy well so it was uh pretty much an accident i i because there, uh, there is no astronomy in ohio right it's no gray skies the whole it's time it's terrible skies <laughs> it's the we have one of the cloudiest cities too it's uh so i got into it pretty much by accident i i went to to college to be a high school history teacher so history Where'd you I, go to college i went to xavier uh -huh. xavier university good and, basketball team yeah very good basketball team uh no more football team but uh, uh -huh. yeah uh, <laughs> so i wanted to do high school history and i got my degree and certificate and all that stuff and then i started teaching and i was like you know uh, i don't know if i want to do this yeah <laughs> so i did nature education at one of the city parks uh and one of the parks had a planetarium and they said hey uh, you're running planetarium shows starting next week 
you better get studying. <laughs> and I just dove in and learned all I could. I just fell in love with the subject. So I'm, I'm completely self-taught. It was uh, completely by accident. I just found like my calling. Like I just love the subject so much. And, 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 you know, I think this is great because, you know, think about astronomy and professional astronomers who do research, you know, the typical path is to get a PhD in astronomy or astrophysics or something like that. But like anything, if you're passionate about something, you can find a way to make a living out of that. Yeah. And, and um, there's so many things in astronomy, you know, research, of course, but education, outreach, um, public relations, you know, I'm historian, public information officer. Oh, yeah. You find a passion and and you can make it work. Yeah, that's how it ended up being is that I, you know, my I'm not out there discovering things, but I, I kind of uh act as this intermediary between the uh discoverers and the uh the scientists and uh making it more relatable to right. the public and uh uh because it's got to make sense to me and if it makes sense to me i can make it make sense right. to you all too so it's uh and that's what's great about this the star party it's it's folks some people who came here specifically um from the star party others who happen to be at grand canyon but there's hundreds of people here uh, so many that are looking through telescopes for the first time in their lives and who knows the inspiration there's a young lady here her name is ella who is just a favorite person of mine um i gave a talk here years ago and this little girl came up dressed in an astronaut spacesuit oh man and said can i have a picture and so years later i gave another talk and she said do you remember me i was in the astronaut suit and and she's here tonight with her own telescope she and her dad but ella is operating the telescope Oh, wow. um, as part of the star party. I think she's the youngest operator here and she's 11 going on 12. Oh my gosh. And so you never know how you're going to get inspired, but also how you inspire other people to go into this. Oh, that's great. I guess we should look at this object we're looking at. This is a little dr dramatic. It's the one I requested, I think. <laughs> yes. So M8, the Lagoon Nebula. So this is a different type of nebula than the Ring Nebula. Uh, what do you got for facts? I don't know the distance of this one off the top of my head. Oh, it's a, it's about four thousand light years away, but it, it's um in Sagittarius. So Sagittarius is still low in the sky right now, but oh, able to get this. Anyway, um, but this is an emission nebula, wow. so the different type of nebula. There's emission. Um, so let's talk about those a little bit. The different kinds of nebula. Yeah, so this one, I always kind of lump this one in with like uh, like star forming regions. Uh -huh. So you've got like the this is we need some help with some English majors because we got nebulas that are exploded stars or dying stars. Then we got nebulas that are star birth regions. So this is a this is a star birth type nebula. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what kind of name we could have for a uh, you know nebula like and plebula. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> explodula i don't know anyway this is a star form so this is kind of like the the orion nebula but this thing is humongous and where we are here i've been able to actually see this with the naked eye here for oh, the dark guy, yeah which is crazy because it is very faint but uh, this picture is really uh bringing what's the exposure on this one uh because you can see this these clouds of gas and dust and those yeah. clouds of gas and dust are condensing to form new stars almost uh, half a minute it's like a star. 29 seconds perfect and you know speaking of time we're gosh we're already um 40 minutes into the program and i think it's a good reminder um this is dean regas the astronomer at cincinnati observatory i'm kevin schindler the historian and public information officer at low observatory and we're pleased to partner with the Grand Canyon Conservancy on this live stream and share images. We're sitting at the Grand Canyon Star Party where um, Dylan, our telescope operator, is operating from Lowell Observatory. So this is this great partnership we have with Grand Canyon Conservancy, um, Grand Canyon National Park, um, to celebrate the night sky. We're sitting in a place on um, this is dark sky park, thanks to the efforts of Raider Lane and so many others. And the images are coming from Flagstaff Low Observatory, the world's first international dark sky city. So this is, you know, we're celebrating the dark skies with these with these uh, star parties, looking up and being able to see the Milky Way with your naked eye. Um, it's it's really remarkable what we can do, and and it's an honor and privilege for us to partner with Grand Canyon Conservancy, Grand Canyon National Park, 
um, to be able to share all this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I I uh, came one of my first Grand Canyon star parties. I came was when they had the pro- pro- provisional designation to yes, be a dark right. sky, and I I gotta say, since then it is way darker <laughs> they did i mean they like took the lights out of everything thousands and, of fixtures they had to switch out and it is incredible i mean driving uh driving away from here and and uh it is just so dark and uh you i think people this is one of the things that i think people are doing is they're adding this to their bucket list they're adding this to their vacation plans and for me this is this is this is my way to get away. And I come to yeah. places like this so I can actually see the stars the way they're supposed to be. So uh, Grand Canyon has done an amazing job. Yes. Uh, and and it, I mean, I, it's noticeable difference even in a few years. And you know, the, the first astronomer in residence was Tyler Nordgren, mm-hmm. who um, is an astronomer. He has ties to Northern Arizona, did a postdoc here. He, he had both he and his wife were here, um, but he's pretty much full time leading astronomy tours. He was the first astronomer in residence, and he coined the term half the park is after dark um, because Grand Canyon is a spectacular display of layers of rocks over time. But then when the when the skies are dark, the lights go out and you look up this spectacularly dark sky. Now that we have, you know, the dark sky um, designation with the darker skies, it's you, you know, you really feel connected to the universe, whether it's during the day looking at those layers of rock or at night looking up to the sky yeah i had this experience as my uh, doing my residency where i set up a telescope outside the el tovar uh, yeah. i just showed people the stars as they were coming out from dinner or something like that and it, like i got to show them saturn and jupiter and those are like the yeah. wow objects and i don't know how many people said you know when they looked and they saw saturn they saw the sky they like this is the best part of my trip. Yeah. And I like, at, I think it's unexpected at first. It, it was unexpected for me to hear it. Cause I'm just like, well, you know, there's like a Canyon like right there, but <laughs> like, like, it's a pretty cool Canyon, but like the stars were better than the Canyon. And it's like that, that's what it's all about. It's, it's amazing. It is. And I think it, it's, you know, it's that human emotion of awe and wonder that that's in all of us. And we're so in tune with staring at phones and everything when you can get away from it all, and just reconnect and see how immense and impressive and inspiring the universe is, whether it's the rocks, the canyon or the skies above. Oh, yeah. It, it makes you want to see it more. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of seeing more, we were continuing Sagittarius. But here's another old classic, the Trifid Nebula, um, also in Sagittarius. And this is uh, 4000 or so light years away. Again, give or take a few light years. What's a few light years between friends? I I'm glad you have the notes there because I I defer to uh, uh, the there's a, a astronomer named John Dobson. I don't know oh, class. Right. Yeah, he would go on the sidewalks, and whenever anybody asked him how far away he thinks something was, he's like, "It's way the heck out there." Yeah, that was like his answer. So uh, I have I'm no. Glad, I'm glad you have the actual notes. That's you know, helpful. my brain cells don't work to remember all the numbers, <laughs> um, and so some of those things I just have written down to make sure that it's somewhat accurate. Um, and so, but, but Trifid is neat because it's kind of a combination of things. It's a, there's open star cluster, there's emission nebula, there's reflection nebula. So it's a little bit, it's, it's like several of the things we've looked at in one, one view here. And here's a question from Caleb. Um, what gives the light or dust around stars and galaxies the different colors? Yeah, so this is uh, either a few things. So it could be elements that we're looking at. It could be temperatures we're looking at. It's so it's mostly this is starlight that's scattering through this and it's kind of reflecting through these things. Uh, so it, it is not exactly you can't say like a one to one thing to everything that's always like star temperature. But uh, this one, I think it is more of the elements that we're looking at here yeah, more than anything. Right. And uh, and uh, I was just going to say, I just saw another comment coming in. We talked about being here at the canyon and, and what makes a visit so important. Like like when you showed those folks um, the sky at El Tovar, yeah. and that was one of the most meaningful parts of their trip. Um, that's what makes these visits for people is you see the dark skies, but when you put it into context, it's so, you know, you have people to do that. And one of the people here, um, Haley Johnson, um, is volunteering tonight, but she's I'm um, done it all here. She gives tours, park ranger stuff, and she wanted to look at Deneb. 
Yes. Um, which oh, is, Haley is, Schist. Yeah. So so her one of her one of her many <laughs> handles is Haley Schist. Uh, but but um, I wait, think her real name's not Schist. No. Wait, that's what she told me. Oh my so, gosh. Uh, I believe, and, like I believe a, and I believed it too. Oh that's gosh! Why lies? This has been exposed. I feel like the world's coming to an end here. I'm like, you work at the Grand Canyon. His last name is Schist. That's but, pretty good. What about but, Feldspar? What about, uh, anyway, but Haley, like you, Haley is somebody else who inspires people every day. So we can humor her. All right. And here's Deneb, the spectacular Deneb, the Sigmund the Swan, a part one of the Summer Triangle stars. Now for this. Well, this is this is the star that also I see a lot of wide varieties of distances to this. Like, uh, you know, since I started being an astronomer, they thought it was 1600 light years, then 3000, then 3200. Yeah. Now they're back down. So I don't know what it is. We don't know how far away this star is. So I usually say this is at least in the neighborhood of one of the farthest stars you can see with the naked yeah. eye. And And, you know, that's the thing you know like you look up and you want to learn about these things but the exact distance i mean technology is getting better but it's still hard to measure yes <laughs> this you know you can't drive a car there and get the odometer running but you know we're getting better and better with measuring distances but it's like um one of the bright stars in the sky tonight is arcturus the fourth brightest star in the night sky and arcturus has a great kind of story behind it it's it's in um Bootes, the herdsman herding the bears across the sky and um, the big bear and little bear or some major or some minor but um in 1893 the world's fair was in chicago 40 years later it was going to be in chicago again so the the nerds who were organizing you know they're celebrating technology and so they decided to point a telescope at arcturus with sensors um and to start the world's fair in 1933 open a telescope light would come through from arcturus for with light that started traveling to us when the last world's fair was in chicago and that's how they kicked off the world's fair um now we know arcturus is more like i don't know 36 light years yeah so well, kinda, it's close yeah but it, it's the idea that counts but oh, you know the things like distances it, it just it just changes you know we get it's kind of you know we say in the right magnitude you know oh, yeah. it's it's it gives you an idea. It's not if it's light years versus millions of light years, whether it's 10 or 20 light years, you know. Well, we have to give a shout out to our telescope operator, Dylan, who is like moving things from one thing. Oh, he's another. missing back and forth. He's yeah, he's on to us, yeah. like just talking about whatever we want to talk about. And he's finding it. So this is Arcturus, I'm assuming. Looks like Arcturus. Got a different color yep. to it than what we just saw with Deneb. The fourth brightest star in the night sky. And uh, so this, uh, when we see star colors, this is usually an indication of their temperatures. So the redder the star, the cooler they are. The bluer the star, the hotter they are. Uh, so Arcturus is on the orange side, so a little cooler than our sun. Uh, but we're still talking, you know, thousands and thousands of degrees. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think we had, uh, uh, Deneb was one of the hotter stars because it was a little more white. And then uh, Vega we had earlier was blue. So you might have noticed that color change with that one. Yeah. And, you know, we've, we've looked at a couple different stars. We looked at a globular star cluster. And maybe we can look at an open star cluster, M6. Uh, I, I think it's high enough now in Scorpius. Yeah, on this so-called butterfly cluster. And and so we talked about these different terms. There's open star cluster, Globular cluster. What's the difference between those? Okay, I was like, Wait. yeah. So if we have, let's see. So we had. Uh, let's. Oh, is this the open cluster? And open clusters aren't as cool looking in general, because they're they're not, they're more spread apart. Yes. Oh, well, so, there we go. Well, I don't know. That's that's kind of dramatic. That that's is cool. pretty cool. So this is six M six. Yeah. And this About one's six, the... six light years away or so. All right. So let's see. Now I'm. Pretty sure the nickname for this is a, a uh, insect, but don't say what it is. Okay. Uh, people are looking at this. Does this look like a shape of a insect? 
It looks like one that I saw on the windshield of the car. Right? <laughs> tonight. It's also known as the butterfly. Nebula. There it is. The butter, yeah, butterfly yeah. cluster. I don't see a butterfly there. But I, anyway. I think, yeah, again, the windshield effect. Yeah, that's maybe. true. Yeah. But uh, this is a cool star cluster just out of off of Scorpius's tail and stinger stars. Super easy to find with a pair of binoculars also. Um, so, yeah, if you see the the, the curving tail of Scorpius's uh, stingers, just uh, browse around yeah. with some binoculars. You'll stumble upon this one and another cluster called M7, uh, which is known as the Ptolemy's cluster because it looks like Ptolemy, right? Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Everybody can see them. Yeah, it looks like the an ancient uh, Alexandrian uh, astronomer. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's you know imagination, like you said. You know they didn't have anything else to do. Right. Oh, time. are we going to seven? Is this seven now? M7. Uh, hey, is just. You know, he's it's just super flipping. fast. Yeah. And we're, we're already, we only have about 10 minutes left. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more. Um, again, thanks to Grand Canyon Conservancy for partnering um, and making this happen. Dean Regas from Cincinnati Observatory. So this program, we have Cincinnati Observatory, Lowell Observatory, Grand Canyon Conservancy, Grand Canyon National Park. Talk about partnerships. Um, and, and that's what the star party is. We have 50 or so telescopes. Amateur astronomers from around the, excuse me, around the country, um, all coming together to share the excitement of space, and it's you know all this working together and partnership stuff is, that's what it's all about. Uh, it's great, and I I mean every so the star parties here happen for eight straight nights, and each night there's more than a thousand people looking through telescopes, and just the the energy of people, their excitement is just so infectious and. Uh, uh man i can't wait till next year right yeah you start making plans already uh, yeah and you know we we're talking a little bit about this open star cluster um open star clusters you know they have a few thousand stars tens to a few thousand stars maybe the globulars have like half a million tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of stars um so different you know they're they're gravitationally bound but there are different types of clusters but there are other open star clusters that are better known on um, the pleiades yeah, um, probably absolutely. one of the the best known ones and we won't be able to see that um unless it's a picture because it's not up in the sky but the pleiades is great because it's um if you look at the the emblem of subaru car yeah it's the pleiades, that's, right. yep. that's, the, that's the seven sisters japanese now, boy, this is a test because I'm not sure what this is yet. Um, it's not. Uh, hmm, oh, hold on. Okay, maybe now I got it. Oh, the eagle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm starting yeah. to see the eagle's beak there. Yeah. So this is also known as M16, the Eagle Nebula, made really famous more recently by the Hubble Telescope yeah. pictures. They call it the Pillars of Creation, a very zoomed in part of the part where Dylan's circling there. That's the the beak of the the yeah. So it's a little, yeah, it's upside down from what that's what it is upside down from what I'm used to. But uh, that's the beak of the eagle. Uh good luck making out any more of any yeah, but right. anyway still it's this is a another star forming region so another one of those uh, uh star factories and so each one of those pillars each one of those like little beaks is you know many 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 times the size of our solar system so there's could be lots and lots of stars that are going to be made by this giant uh giant formation you know you think about um i don't know there's something about it you go to a hospital and you go to the nursery and they're little babies. This is a stellar nursery. Like stars are being formed here right now. And we now have the technology to see them in different stages of development. Yeah, and again, you look at the passage of time. It hasn't been that long ago that that was a dream. Yep. Um, and we're doing things like this and discovering stars or planets around other stars. It hasn't been that long ago that, you know, we knew about planets in our solar system. But there probably are other planets out there, but we can't, we don't have the technology to see them. And now we're finding, you know, we know of thousands and, and the more technology we get, we're finding many more. And now one of the goals is to look for earth-like planets. And it gets back to that very human question. Are we alone? Is there, are there others out there like us? And if we're going to look for, you know, life, something like us, we start with what we're familiar with, which yeah. is like an earth-sized planet. Yeah, it's incredible that 
Yeah, this the the technology that we're using here is unbelievable. I mean, like I, I'm I, I'm blown away by these pictures that are coming through as we're just like saying, "Hey, go point at this," and then he points right. at it, and then we get these. You know, uh, so what's the exposure on this one? I'm kind of curious. Just uh, to so because to the eye, if you look through this through a telescope here at the star party, you're not going to see it quite like this. You're going to see the cluster of stars. You won't quite see the cloudiness, the cloudy nature of it. So, yeah, 29 second exposure. That's uh, um, and uh, I don't know if uh, if other people have read this, but there's been some kind of exaggerations about you know what you can see with a telescope, what yeah. you can't see with a telescope. And I keep reading like, oh, all you need is a little backyard telescope to see the super it magnifies, nova. yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, um, I don't think so. You you got to have a, some a good size scope and a really good camera to bring this out. Yes. Um, I so this is this is one of the the pluses that we get to see this, and I, I mean like. To do this in real time is 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 really incredible. I think you know there's something there's something good about this um, because we're winding down. We only have a couple minutes left, um, but and so it's a good time to talk a little bit about what we've seen tonight. You know this variety of things, and this is just in an hour. And like you said, we're sitting outside at a table under the dark skies, and Dylan's whipping the telescope around, looking at all these great things. Um, and I think um, one of our viewers. Um, David said it well. He said, here's to you, Dylan. Um, so if we had a toast here, you have naked green machine there, so uh, we could do the toast there. But, but um, you know, you know, we've said it before tonight, making things happen. It's all about collaboration. The people at the Star Party, um, you coming from Ohio, the Grand Canyon Conservancy, Grand Canyon National Park, um, all these partnerships that work together. So we appreciate everybody watching and, and supporting digital programming like this. Um, encourage you to follow us online. Um, again, Lowell Observatory, um, Grand Canyon Conservancy, uh, National Park Service, Cincinnati Observatory. Um, all of these organizations work together, have such great messages, doing such great work. And it's great for everybody to come together and be able to share these great images. Yeah, and thanks for the questions and requests, and uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Yeah, this is cool. We've got about four minutes, so I think we should, Dylan, if you can put it on one more object, um, let's try that. Yeah, let me think. What are we missing? We got uh, galaxies, we got nebulas, we got planetary nebula, we got open cluster, globular cluster, double star. Man, we've seen a lot. Um. Let me think. What is it's funny, there? you know, you know, some might say, well, how about the moon? And yeah. that, that's why we're well, that's why the star party is now, because the moon is really spectacular to look at through a telescope to see details and comparison to things on Earth. But for seeing the dark skies, obviously the moonlight gets in the way. So to see dark sky objects, just like to look at a meteor shower, you want to go away from the city lights and you know, we talked about light pollution. The light pollution isn't a one-way deal. Like, everybody can help with light pollution and reduce it and make the skies darker. Yeah, so no moon uh, no moon right now. Uh, and all the other planets are kind of out of the way. So uh, Mercury and... Uh, um, well, yeah, hold on. We got a couple more messages. There we go. There you go. Oh, dumbbell. That's what, yeah, yep. That's what we wanted. Uh, the M27, yeah. I think this is one of my favorites because there's something like ethereal about it. I, I mean, it's, it's like almost ghostly. Yeah. No, yeah, this is the Dumbbell Nebula, another planetary nebula, so another uh, star at the end of its life. And um, this one, uh, like I saw this last night through one of the scopes out here. Yeah. And it, it, it had a hint of color, not quite this much color, but you could actually detect a little bit of color with this, even just without the camera. Um, but this is a really cool uh, one. I always have trouble finding this because it's kind it's of, faint. Yeah. it hangs out in the middle of nowhere and there's no stars around it that I can ever find. And I got an old telescope, so I need like one of these fancy ones like you guys have. you know you know i i feel <laughs> kind of funny because i for years i worked in the public program and lived up there this was always a great thing to look at but but sometimes it was tough because it was late in the night 
the telescope would be right in the pier, oh, you know, man, it's practically yeah. overhead. And so I, I have memories of, okay, we can't see it tonight, you know, much later in the night when it's higher in the sky. Yeah. Um, but it's just the detail with it is really spectacular. And this is, a, I think, a great thing to end with. Oh, yeah. um, we're just about out of time. We could do this all night. This I know. Is so much this fun. is really cool. This awesome job, Dylan, getting all these pictures and, uh, and super fast, too. This is really cool. Yeah. Thank, thanks to Alex and Heather and Cody for behind the scenes work in making all this happen. Um, thanks to our Grand Canyon Conservancy National Park Service partners um, who's broadcasting this and just makes. You know, the program at the Canyon is impossible without all them. It's spectacular. And of course, we thank everybody for watching. Um, you know, we're all out here because we love the night sky and love to share it. And um, to have people share it with is part of the fun. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me join, too. Oh, this is great. It's been, been fun. I'm crashing your party here, I hope. Oh, no, you are the party. Good. Oh, good. All right. Even better. All right. <laughs> yeah. Great. Glad to be here. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, that's a wrap for tonight. Um, we'll do this again. I think this should be an annual thing, but even before the next Grand Canyon Star Party, I think we should do more of these because they're they're really fun and easy to do. And thanks, Dylan, again for all your hard work behind the scenes on the telescope. Thanks, everybody.